Okay, good afternoon and welcome back to Graph Guy. Uh, real quick, I want to jump to the as promised upgraded puppy cam to a good puppy opportunity right out of the gate for you. There we go. There's the sleeping boy. He's already, I'm sure he'll be, uh, there he goes with the ball. I'm sure he'll be uh, wanting to have that thrown very shortly. Yeah, he loves, he loves his toy. All right. Didn't want to disappoint on the as promised upgraded puppy cam. So uh, today I'm uh, going to chat a little bit about uh, so what I see coming in terms of graph data. What, what's happening with the space uh, of, of significance, uh, why, it, why it matters to us, uh, and, and so on. So um, Without any further ado, uh, let's go ahead and uh, take a, a peek at that. And that is, there we go. So, um, if we're going to start talking about the future of graph databases, um, let's begin with uh, actions. There we go, go different view. Uh, let's actually go ahead and uh, start off by looking at the trends, right? So, we, we've, in early episodes, we looked at a similar version of this. Uh, where we looked just specifically at um, what are more popular in graph databases. This again is dbengines.com. Um, and here looking at all of the database engines uh, in terms of the uh, type. So what types are, are trending? You can see uh, here as well. Uh, this is the trends uh, by specific uh, type of database uh, actually. So. Oracle and, and so on. All the really big ones that you would think, the generalist players, Oracle, MySQL, um, and, and so on. Uh, but let's look at rankings by database model, which is what I'm particularly interested in here. Uh, so here we can see like percentage of, uh, uh, by number of systems in the category. Um, this is different, this talks about like how many database uh, databases actually exist in that category. I'm going to come back to this in a little bit. Uh, what I'm really interested in at the moment is this. Uh, this is trying to show the historical trend uh, of the popularity of a given category. right? So if we're interested in what's happening um, in the future with graph databases, uh, we want to understand obviously what has happened in the past and what is the trajectory of that. Or, or, um, has graph database peaked? Are people no longer interested? Is it plateaued out? Is it rising, etc.? So as you can see right here, uh, that top line as far as trend is graph databases. And if we drew a line through that, right, uh, that is a pretty nice slope. Uh, the increase in popularity is still trending uh, very, very high since about 2013. Uh, if we look, you know, we look at the last 24 months, last 12 months, and of course you see uh, significant fluctuations because you're looking at smaller uh, periods of time. But again, if you look at the overall, the last several years, back to 2013, uh, this is a good trend. Uh, and this again means that more and more people are looking at that databases. Uh, more and more people are going to be um, uh, adopting graph databases into the enterprise. Uh, and as someone who's uh, been out there for a number of years and uh, talking to people uh, about database management systems, uh, about graph database in particular, uh, I, I can absolutely confirm this anecdotally. So if you go back to say uh, around this period of time, 2017, 2018, uh, most of the times when I have conversations with people about graph databases, uh, you would see a very puzzled look, and you'd have to start with explaining to people what is a graph database uh, and why might you need it. You fast forward now to early 2022, and they're completely different conversations that we're having. Uh, now the conversation uh, is really uh, about people saying, I know I have a graph problem, uh, and I may or may not have already tried to use a graph database, uh, but I need some help in adopting that and uh, realizing the potential of a graph database uh, for, my, uh, for my business. Uh, so again, a huge, huge shift in, in terms of uh, what I'm seeing out there, talking to executives, talking to architects and developers. Uh, most developers have heard of it. Many, many have downloaded some type of a graph database and played with it in some way or another. Um, 
and that very much matches what we're seeing here. Um, we can go and we can look uh, at another source to confirm this. Uh, this is Market Watch. This is a report that actually came out just the end of last year. Uh, you know, uh, analysis and insight into the graph database market. And I'm going to see even bigger because it is a bit of an eye chart. Uh, you can certainly read this. We can post the links to, to these things as well. Um, but uh, most interestingly here, uh, they're predicting that the global market is was around uh, 1 billion US dollars in 2019. Uh, and it's going to grow 2.9 billion in 2024 for about 22% annual growth rate. Uh, I'm not a VC. I'm not. That's. I'm not into. Uh, not a finance guy. Uh, but that's a pretty good number, right? Again, that tells me yes, people are planning on investing in graph databases. There is uh, interest in the space, and there's enough interest that people are willing to spend money. Uh, and of course, uh, dollars are what's going to drive more development uh, and more innovation in the space. So. Uh, Having established, I hope, that graph databases are, are still very much on the rise, and I think we're at a good spot in terms of really getting into the uh, adoption portion of the curve, uh, where they're going to be move from being an outlier to something standard in most major enterprises. Um, let's talk a bit about the challenges right now. Uh, the challenges, of course, right now, um, is there are is the market is fragmented, right? There are a number of different graph database vendors. There's a number of major vendors of um, non-traditional, uh, or rather non-graph database, specific databases uh, that sort of add on graph database capabilities uh, to meet certain needs. Uh, and navigating that is, is certainly challenging. In the previous episode, uh, you saw I went through the DB Engine's list of graph databases and we explored a bunch and talked about their pros and cons and, and, and so forth. Um, so what are the sort of the obstacles or the barriers standing in the way of adoption right now? Um, and really the number one uh, barrier to adoption, uh, at least in my mind, is standardization. Uh, so what do, what do I mean by that? Uh, well, right now, there are a couple of really major uh, players in the graph database space. You know, there's, there's Neo4j, certainly, there's TigerGraph, Oracle has a product, um, you know, there's some RDF players and so on, but there's, you know, really aren't legal property graph. Uh, you know, there's uh, Microsoft's Cosmos DB has an overlay, essentially, for that. Um, and the, the challenge, though, right, is businesses, particularly large businesses, of course, are always concerned about risk. Um, hold on here. I probably, if I don't, if I don't uh, throw the ball for the dog, it's going to get very loud in here. All right. Um, major companies, of course, uh, are always concerned with risk. And uh, when you tell them that they need to adopt a new technology like a graph database, uh, they always have a number of questions like, just like who are the major vendors? Uh, what is my cost to adopt the new technology? Uh, am I locked into a vendor? Is there a vendor lock-in happening? Because if I'm locked into a certain vendor, what happens if that vendor goes away? What, what they become obsolete? What if a new product comes out in the space and they want to switch to that because it gives you more capability or lower cost, for example? Um, these are all um, sort of risk-based questions uh, that the enterprise needs to understand the answers to in order to invest in a new technology. Because if I think it's particularly risky, of course, I'm much less likely to spend money on to, to, into the area matures. And that's the challenge we're facing right now. Um, there is no standard way of uh, connecting to a graph database, right? So if you're talking about a SQL database, a relational database, uh, there's a couple of, of really, really standardized ways of uh, connecting to them from a, pro, uh, from a programmatic, uh, programmatic standpoint, right? If you're writing uh, some software, uh, you know, there's uh, ODBC drivers in the Java space, there's JDBC drivers, and they're all very, very standardized and can be used to talk to really any number of different relational databases using the same protocol. And again, that's super important because it reduces the risk in adopting any particular relational database. A second aspect of that is how do I talk to the database? 
How do I write queries against it? How do I load data into it? Again, um, relational databases, which have been around for uh, a very long time. Uh, the uh, W3C uh, standardization group has, of course, uh, standardized for a while the, the uh, various uh, versions of the, uh, actually it's the ANSI uh, SQL specification. So, uh, the, so if you want to wear it, SQL or SQL is, of course, the language that we use to uh, work with, to query, to insert data into a relational database. And again, it is standardized. So uh, for the most part, queries that I write today on Oracle or Sybase or SQL Server uh, or MariaDB, um, I can port those to another database if for some reason I need to change uh, my existing implementation. Um, yes. There absolutely can be slight variations and extensions and so on per uh, product, but the core of it is standardized. So again, that makes a, is a huge uh, risk reduction uh, for, um, uh, you know, for, uh, for enterprises who are, who are adopting these things. The problem right now is in graph databases, there isn't that standard query language. Uh, there are many of them. Uh, the good news is uh, that is starting to change. So the W3C, and let's make this a little larger for you as well, uh, in early 2017 um, started to raise the issue, uh, or rather different, different industry partners, uh, vendors, uh, started to raise the issue in early 2017 uh, uh, of this challenge. In, in this space, uh, came out something called the, the Graph Query Language Manifesto um, in May of 2018, and the uh, W3C did, as a matter of fact, uh, adopt uh, and create a working group to create a standard for graph query language. This is super, super important, right? Um, so what, what is actually happening uh, there? Well, if we look at the, the uh, graph, uh, uh, query, graph Query Language Manifesto, um, get a cool little picture here and you see some of the major players. Um, and this is an interesting read. These are again, um, some of the major players, especially at that time in this space. Um, but we see a number of different major languages that exist. So Cypher or Open Cypher, uh, which is the language created by Neo4j originally, uh, again, they're the original inventors of the uh, property, uh, labeled property graph. Um, GQL, uh, which is uh, sort of a um, exploratory lane, look at that as well. Uh, there's SQL extensions and uh, the property graph query language uh, created by Oracle. So there's a number of different major ones. Let's take a quick peek at uh, a couple of those. Uh, before we do again, here is the uh, W3C uh, workshop report on standardization for graph data. Uh, this actually came out uh, out of uh, the March 2019 workshop that was in Berlin. It has since progressed. Um, the group is working um, very hard towards finalizing uh, a recommendation. Uh, once that you know is finally finalized and accepted, there will have to be, of course, a uh, uh, a reference implementation created, as well as a technical uh, TCK, basically technical compliance uh, check, so, so anyone who wants to uh, implement the new language can uh, validate that they are compliant through the, through the TCK. Um, so like I said that, the, there are several major languages, three in particular that are called out significantly uh, in the Graph Query Language Manifesto um, that are driving this. Open Cypher is one of the largest ones. Again, uh, so when Neo uh, really first launched the label property graph, they created Cypher uh, as a way to query it. Uh, and uh, several years ago, uh, led by Alistair Green, uh, they launched uh, an open source version of that called Open Cypher. And Open Cypher is, uh, you know, pretty widely used. Uh, Neo4j obviously uses it. There are some other companies that use it as well uh, to query their graph database. Uh, so they're a really big driver. OpenCypher, in my opinion, is, is very nice because uh, 
as we've talked about in previous episodes, Cypher is a pretty easy language to learn. It's very expressive, uh, and, and so I'm a big fan of that. Another major language there is uh, Oracle's property graph query language. So as I mentioned earlier in this uh, talk, uh, Oracle does have some essentially graph extensions to some of their databases uh, to let you deal with the relational content as though it were a graph. And you query that using uh, property uh, graph query language. So, uh, you know, here are some examples of, of what that can look like. Um, you can see, uh, unsurprisingly, from a company that is very, very invested in SQL, property graph query language looks uh, a lot like SQL. Um, this looks a little bit like Cypher, right? But a lot of this um, looks pretty similar just to, to SQL. Um, again, looks a little more like Cypher here. Um, so it's clearly uh, some kind of a, of a hybrid uh, between the two languages. Then there's G-Core. Uh, G-Core, uh, which is called there, is basically um, almost an experimental or, a, or an academic language uh, designed by the uh, LDBC Graph Query Language Task Force, so it's an early precursor to the working group uh, now. Uh, and again, you can see a lot of the major players here are some of the players that st are still taking part uh, in driving the uh, existing W3C uh, property graph query language uh, working group. Um, and this is a pretty uh, intense paper talking about the need for that and the standards, and there's a whole bunch of math and so forth. Uh, but if you look at it and you kind of scroll down, uh, you can see it, it looks, again, um, fairly similar to Cypher. Um, and we have a lot of... Dog. Yes, hello, dog. Um, so clearly uh, open... Oh my, sorry, we are being inundated with dog. Uh, clearly open Cypher is, is driving uh, a lot of how people uh, think about querying the graph, this type of a, of a readable sort of ANSI, uh, sort of, uh, ANSI art type of a uh, syntax uh, has really been popular with a lot of developers and is clearly is, is, you know, continuing to be adopted and uh, moved forward. There is a fourth uh, major language, at least in uh, my opinion. It's not uh, specifically called out in a prominent way by the, the GQL manifesto, um, but it's it's still a very heavily in use. And that is the whole, uh, that is, the language itself is Gremlin. Uh, the, the entire stack is uh, Tinkerpop, and this is an uh, open sourced uh, Apache. <coughs> uh, yes. oh, and all righty. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, as you can see, Gremlin is used by a number of, of, of systems like uh, TitanDB, uh, BlazeGraph, Orient, um, and, and, so, and so on. Um, Gremlin uh, is actually based uh, or written in, implemented in uh, Groovy, Groovy being a programming language uh, that sits on top of the Java Virtual Machine platform. Uh, and so it looks very programmatic, right? This is some sample uh, Gremlin code here, uh, as well as down here. Looks very different than Cypher. Looks very different than SQL, right? Well, those are more declarative languages. Uh, this is very much a, a programmatic language. Um, so there are a number of people who really, really love Gremlin um, uh, and the whole Tinkerpop stack. Uh, it certainly does have pretty widespread adoption on a number of, of the uh, large platforms. Um, personally, I, I do, even though I am a, a software engineer by profession and training, um, I, I do find this a bit more difficult to, to deal with. And I, I like the, the simplicity, as I've mentioned in the past, and the um, readability um, of, uh, of Cypher. So... Um, what is going to happen really becomes you know, the question. If you go back and, and we look at uh, you know, the site, um, is really they're, they're taking the, uh, a lot of the 
functionality and the benefits and features that are present in other ones. And of course, they're merging it together, right? Um, and the reason this is important is without this, a couple of things are happening. One, businesses, of course, are very reluctant to, as I mentioned earlier, um, spend a ton of money in the space. Um, why? Uh, certainly, for one, again, I mentioned, because what if I need to change off the graph database to another one? Uh, what is the cost of that? And the cost of change right now, unfortunately, is very high uh, because I might have to change a, a connection protocol and I certainly might have to change my query language. Um, so if I'm looking at this, I've got to spend time and money uh, training my engineering staff on uh, a new way of talking to the database in addition, of course, in a new way of thinking about the data in terms of graph, uh, and I might have to redo that and change it. Uh, once the graph query language is finalized and is published uh, and then adopted by major vendors, uh, that barrier should go away and make this much, much easier to adopt. Fortunately, in the, in the very short near term, um, in short near term, I'm going to have to throw this ball. All you're going to hear is barking. I apologize. All right, there goes the ball. Um, in the very short term, I think to a certain degree, the fact that the working group uh, is nearing the finish line may actually be putting the brakes to some degree uh, on short term adoption. All right, if, if I know that. 12 to 18 months, just throwing out a number there. Um, this might be standardized and other uh, vendors and things uh, picking up on this language. If I just pause that, acquis that, that, that uh, acquisition of this new technology uh, for that period of time, uh, then uh, I, I can wait until it's adopted uh, and reduce my risk and, and see how things sort of shake out at that time. So this might be putting, again, a... a sort of tactical pause and adoption for some of the uh, enterprises. The other thing that I think is going to happen is um, if we uh, go back to DB engines for a moment and we look at uh, where is our, our graph databases and we look at the major graph databases and again we've done this a little bit before um, and we kind of filter out, I can't unfortunately uh, do it uh, on here. Uh, so if I just sort of going through this filter out, the ones that aren't native labeled property graph, right? So that's not native property graph. That's not, that's not, that's not. Uh, other than Neo, I got to jump down to like Janus graph and Tiger graph, and then down the D graph, G graph. Um, the key thing to notice here is there are no big vendor names. Yes, Neo4j has raised a bunch of money, especially recently. But if you look at the size of the database vendors and you look at them in the context, um, then uh, no, they're not a big company, right? Microsoft only appears here with Cosmos DB, which is a multi-model property graph. Um, please, please grab the dog, and uh, you don't see you don't see you know uh, you don't see IBM. You don't see Oracle in a meaningful way. Uh, you don't see Sybase. You don't see any of the really, really large technology companies on here. Um, uh, you, don't, you don't see Amazon. Again, Neptune, actually, you know, again, multi-model, not legal property graph. Um, same thing with uh, Google even. Uh, why, again, in my opinion, there, if you're a really, really large technology company like those uh, companies, and you have a lot of experience understanding in how to build a database, which is a very, uh, which is a very uh, specific uh, skill set, very high price skill set to people who really know how to build an enter enterprise class database. It doesn't make a lot of sense to invest in that right now when you know that you're going to have to either adopt an existing language that's likely to, uh, it's going to go away, or create your own language, which is definitely going to go away. Uh, because in the very near term, uh, this new uh, standardized language is going to launch. So you're going to wait. You're going to wait until that is, uh, if not finalized, then really, really close. And then you can start putting engineering dollars into that and launch into this space. So uh, I really predict that within 12 months of the um, 
of at least the reference implementation, if not the TCK being dropped uh, from the working group, you're going to start seeing uh, the entrance of major players uh, in this space putting in labeled property graph natively. Not, not as an afterthought uh, as you've seen right now, uh, but really jumping into this space. The, the trends that we're seeing in terms of adoption, uh, people that are saying they're going to spend money on it, uh, that's enough money to drive these large companies uh, into that space. Might they do it by acquisition? Uh, you know, might someone want to gobble up Neo or another company? Sure, maybe. Um, but either way, they're going to come in and you're going to start to get big, uh, sort of big tech money uh, in this space, I believe. So what is the other thing that is keeping uh, businesses away from this right now? Uh, it's, it's interoperability, right? It's compatibility. Um, no business just uses a database. You have to connect it to something else, some kind of reporting tool, a BI tool, maybe you're writing custom applications, but there's an, there's an ecosystem that it has to live in. And the reality is most of those ecosystems are still relational. Yes, there are some that are document-based or columnar-based, but for the most part, they've got relational standards and other things. So if you want to do uh, BI or business intelligence, and you start searching for example, graph BI tools, well, we can start going through these, but what you're going to see very quickly, and I recommend you go through the exercise on your own, none of these are actually graph native business intelligence. Um, there are some tools, uh, well, that back. Neo4j, for example, has released a connector to Tableau, um, but again, it's, it's, it's not native. What I mean by that is all of these BI tools think about the data in a tabular way. So what they really want is for you to express your data uh, in, in rows and columns, in tables. And they have lots and lots of really good facilities for allowing you inside of their tool to connect to tables, to get your data, uh, to then of course build dashboards and so forth. And that just doesn't translate well to a graph. The model is different. The way of thinking about the data is completely different. Uh, and I'm using BI as an, as an example uh, because it is something that uh, whose end product, those reports, those dashboards, are very often seen at the highest levels of large corporations, at the C-suite, at the VP level, the people who are making the decisions, influencing or making the buying decisions for technology. So if we want those people to buy a graph database and use it for something, it needs to be able to easily uh, connect to their existing tools. Uh, BI being you know, one of the top ones in those lists. Uh, and they don't right now. Uh, again, why not? Uh, because there's no standard query language, right? So if you are a major BI vendor, if you are Tableau, if you're MicroStrategy, uh, if you're Periscope, if you're Click, it makes little to no sense right now to spend a lot of money to connect directly to a graph database uh, because one, the market's not that large yet. Uh, and when I say the market's not that large yet, you have to remember, because there's no standard query language, there's no standard connection protocol, they basically have to pick one database. I'm gonna support Neo4j. I'm gonna support Cosmos DB. Uh, I'm gonna support Tinkerpop. Um, very, very different. So even though Tinkerpop and Cosmos, sorry, uh, rather, um, not Tinkerpop, but uh, I'm gonna support Cosmos DB or I'm gonna support um, uh, Titan DB. Uh, while both Titan and Cosmos can be queried using Gremlin, the connection protocol is completely different. Um, and certain things aren't going to work the same. The indexing is different and so forth. Um, so they would really have to pick just one database they're going to support. And no single graph database vendor has really captured uh, a large enough market share for that really to be worth the money in investing, at least in my opinion, right now. Uh, so. Uh, it only makes sense for the large tool vendors uh, to invest in native integration once there's a standardized space again. If I can build um, into my capability uh, a standard connection for, for graph that supports four, five, six, a dozen different databases, now it's worth it because now I can get the whole big chunk of that. But that's again not going to happen until the uh, other, until the, the work group finishes, puts out the reference implementation, puts out the TCK. Um, so you really have to have, uh, you know, that interoperability uh, for it to, you know, to, to really work. 
So, um, again, I'm very, very bullish, generally speaking, um, on what's happening uh, in, in the market space. There we go. Uh, what's happening in the market space, uh, I think we're in a really good spot, and I think we're really poised on the precipice of much, much more significant adoption uh, once we get the initial query language standardized uh, and, and put out there. I think things are going to happen very, very quickly. So hopefully uh, this has been a little bit helpful for those of you thinking about uh, how this is going to play out in the near future and trying to make some plans. Uh, we'll check back in, in in a year or so and see how my predictions have uh, panned out. Uh, but I hope you've uh, enjoyed this. Uh, please tell your friends. Uh, and uh, as always, you can uh, see replays of this or previous casts on uh, graphguy, graph-guy.com. Uh, thanks for tuning in today. I'm Clark Ritchie, and I'm the Graph Guy.